Hey everyone, uh, we're looking to hire a part-time communications manager to join the Epicenter team. You can get more information about that position at epicenter.tv slash apply. So if you're interested in learning more about that, if you have, think you have what it takes, go to that website uh, and uh, you'll find the job description and uh, the instructions on how to apply for our communications manager position. Thanks. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Tom Ding and Dominic Williams. They are CEO and president slash co-founders of uh, String Labs. Now, um, Tom has actually been a guest on this show before, a long time ago, at the time he was the CEO of a company called Coinify, which were uh, sort of doing you're managing crowd sales back then, uh, quite ahead of its time, I think. Now this has boomed a lot. So, and Dominic, we've been wanting to get on for a long time as well. He was working on on stable coin concepts already, I guess also maybe two years ago or something like that. So thanks so much for coming on, guys. Pleasure. Good to be here. So would you mind running us through, maybe both of you guys, how did you first get involved in the blockchain cryptocurrency space and how did that what was the journey to get to string string labs so yeah so i got uh, uh, into bitcoin probably about late uh, 2013 uh, bitcoin price was or actually early 2013 bitcoin price was like 80 or something ignore that for a while and then saw the white paper like a lot of people and then kind of realized this is there's something into it so my first journey into it was looking from the perspective of what are the um, interesting kind of um, uh, crowdfunding kind of a uh, uh, model that can revolutionize a traditional crowdfunding model so that that was a bit of time at, at coinify and then also did a, another more uh, interesting kind of side project blockchain university uh, which at the time started kind of a first in-person developer education program. Uh, it's really kind of a nonprofit community program, but it uh, really helped bootstrap, I think, some of the community and awareness around blockchain technology. I had like 300 or 400 graduates out of that program. Uh, a lot of people out of that program are still pretty active, I think, in the industry. Uh, but later on, I think what gets for me more interesting was how could the new kind of decentralized uh, technology could change some of the very fundamental way of how uh, business can be can be done. And that kind of lead a lot of a uh, discussion later on with Dominic. And, um, um, you know, uh, I think it's really interesting to me was starting with things like mirror assets. How could you create digital assets in a decentralized fashion, completely decentralized fashion? Uh, that kind of started the journey with String Labs. Uh, we started with Mirror Assets and uh, move on later on to uh, the Definity project, um, which is a, a new uh, decentralized network that we're going to talk about today. Well, I'm a long-time sort of hacker entrepreneur with um, interests in uh, distributed computing. I actually uh, first came across some of the ideas behind Bitcoin in... Um, a paper called B Money by Wei Dai in, in, I think it was 1998 or 1999. And I was using his Crypto++ library to create a certificate system. And you know, I read the paper, thought it was very interesting, was very busy with uh, an online storage startup actually back then. And then uh, sort of 2011, I launched this uh, kids game, uh, which grew enormously. It ended up with 3 million users. And through that, I did a lot of work on uh, distributed systems, uh, scalable application servers. I worked with a database called Cassandra. In fact, we had, which is a scalable database used by Netflix. Now we had the first complex production uh, sort of implementation of, of that. And I contributed various code to it. So 
I mean, it was during that time, you know, I was uh, thinking, I mean, Cassandra in some ways is a, dis is a decentralized database anyways, right? Uh, you, you know, you add these servers to, when, whenever you want to increase the uh, computational capacity and the storage capacity of your cluster, you just add a new server to the database's gossip network. So I was already thinking, you know, how far can this be taken? And, and, and then, you know, uh, Bitcoin sort of crashed its way back into the uh, common consciousness in a major way in uh, April 2013. And I think partly because I was primed from Wei Dai's thing, partly because I was, you know, into distributed systems in a big way, I kind of, uh, I was looking for something else to do and I just very quickly became completely consumed by decentralized protocols and trading crypto tokens and, you know, it just took over my life. And here I am today. It's fascinating that you, you mentioned uh, Wei Dai's B-Money. Uh, a lot of people don't really, you know, think that there were any decentralized distributed currencies before Bitcoin, but this one is sort of a weird predecessor uh, that actually Satoshi referenced uh, when creating Bitcoin that bored a lot of the same principles uh, as Bitcoin. So I encourage anyone who's... Uh, interested in that to go read up about, about B-Money. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's talk about String Labs then. Tell us about the company and what you guys are trying to achieve. Yeah, so I guess we position uh, String Labs really as a kind of um, incubator and um, kind of rocket launcher, if you will, for many different decentralized opportunity. If you think about a layer of opportunity within the decentralized space, uh, there's obviously the very fundamental um, problems we're trying to address like scalability, privacy, and et cetera, uh, business adaptations, uh, the very network layer. On top of that, you have many common uh, needs that a lot of businesses and decentralized uh, startups or uh, um, constructs would need. For example, stable currency, identities, arbitration, et cetera, et cetera. I think we, we kind of position String Labs as a general incubator and investors and developer ourselves of creating both in-house and, and, and external projects. Uh, to launch project in, at, at these different layers, uh, which is quite a unique model. It's a venture backed, but most of the projects we create, when it gets to certain maturity, once it pushed to certain stage, uh, they will have they will have their own independent existence. And which is one of the very nice thing about these types of project, they are independent protocols. They're not necessarily controlled by any uh, certain organizations. So we're kind of uniquely benefiting from this venture backing with stable financial stability. Uh, but also the ability to create uh, neutral and independent protocols. I'm curious that you, you know, so you say you're, you're a venture backed company and that's definitely one, one position to have as opposed to you know, relying on a crowd sale. Um, why do you think so many other companies or other projects in this space uh, are going towards the crowd sale route rather than uh, you know, going in the direction that you've taken, which is to raise capital? We kind of, by the way, prefer the term uh, donation, which kind of more precisely reflect the, the nature of the process. But anyway, I think the difference, I guess, part of that, I, I think we're quite lucky. We have some really good visionary backers, including like IDG, uh, Amino Capital, Fambusha Capital, which is, I think, was the first $50 million dedicated fund from the Manchang Group, uh, probably the first in the world. Um, but I, I think with these kind of a, a venture backing, it creates a more stable structure. Because in general, there's a, there's a kind of a fallacy or concern of you rushing too quickly into the donation phase. Say, hey, everyone, please donate before the project even reaches a certain, certain stage. I mean, do not, I mean donations, donations does not sound at all uh, like a good description of what's going on with that. I think at the moment in the market, it's probably not true. But, you know, the, the right way to look at this is that a foundation... Well, look, I mean, you know, the whole point about a decentralized network is that there isn't, it doesn't depend upon some organization or individual, right? So once you've created that network, um, you know, it's fundamentally dependent on a decentralized community of independent miners, right? So, you know, it's possible to create a not-for-profit sort of tax-exempt foundation, right, in somewhere like Zug, Switzerland, and it's possible for that thing to collect donations, right? And then take those donations to develop the technology. And it's also possible for that foundation to recommend when the technology is ready, 
that people who've donated to the foundation and otherwise contributed to the um, birth of the uh, project allocated, you know, some reward in the Genesis block. But actually, you know, the foundation, it's not even in the power of the foundation to um, issue tokens to people because all it can do is recommend something to the miners, right? It's ultimately, you know, whatever Genesis block a foundation recommends, it's ultimately up to the miners to adopt the recommendation and, uh, you know, make that real. I mean, I, I can see why one phrases that, of course, to avoid some legal liabilities and, and stuff like that, but it does not at all sound like an accurate description or it doesn't at all sound like it describes the motivations of both the people who donate slash invest in these projects, nor the people creating them. That's true. I mean, I they, think, they're yeah, giving think... money because of the expectation of a financial return, which is not a donation. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, people will take different approaches and, you know, I think we'll probably exemplify a slightly different approach. Um, you know, I think tokens should be designed very much to enable participation and you know, I think there are some kind of slightly shady things that go on in the industry, you know, frankly, at the moment. And, you know, we would not want to um, follow that path or would encourage other people not to follow that path. You know, I think it's true that there are a lot of people who would like to, um, you know, make money or gain resources through launching these systems. And that's fine. And that's fair enough. But, you know, the exact process by which that is done is very, very important. And, you know, we shouldn't be encouraging FOMO-based, pump and dump, speculative kind of shitcoin <laughs> um, ventures, right? You know. Yeah, totally. Let, let's, let's come back to Definity. So what are you trying to accomplish here with, with Definity? What, what's the project going to look like and, and what kind of difference is it going to make in the blockchain space? So Definity is, you know, positioned as an extension to the Ethereum ecosystem that's governed using a, a, a kind of decentralized intelligence called the blockchain nervous system. And it introduces a lot of new crypto and decentralized network protocols that have been sort of in the works since 2014. Firstly, with a project called Pebble and uh, then later with with Definity. And, you know, these protocols are very interesting. They introduce some completely new properties uh, with specific regards to scalability. You know, we want to create an infinite decentralized cloud that can eventually host, um, you know, big public infrastructures like Twitter, Gmail, Uber, um, e even web search. And as well as, you know, financial exchanges and various other business applications. All of the crypto and the protocols, you know, we're, we're deliberately not patenting anything. We're, it's, it's all open source. So, you know, it could be um, backported into Ethereum. You know, so the main distinction ultimately is, you know, governed versus ungoverned. So um, you mentioned something like a decentralized uh, Twitter or, or some of those decentralized search. Um, now, my understanding, I guess, is with Ethereum, I'm not sure if that's really an objective to get to, to that kind of level, but if it's more the objective to have, you know, sort of this core logic of distributed applications in there and a lot of other things take place elsewhere. So is, is that a differentiation as well that you guys are trying to put sort of uh, entire full applications on the chain, whereas uh, Ethereum applications might be more of a bit of a hybrid? So yeah, I think that probably is a distinguishing factor currently. I'm not sure if it'll stay a distinguishing factor. So Definity was, uh, you know, begun with the specific aim of, of, of being able to host that kind of stuff and creating this, you know, infinite decentralized cloud. Um, I think because of the history of Ethereum, you know, um, there is a, an, there's a sort of concept out there that it, it, it should only be used for high value fiduciary applications and that wherever necessary, you know, wherever it needs to, um, you know, be linked to storage, for example, you know, some large file, the, the large file should reside on IPFS. 
Uh, you know, that we certainly, you know, we don't share that vision right now. You know, we uh, want to produce an infinite decentralized cloud which can store data and, and perform any number of computations as necessary. And the research work was begun um, with the basic requirement that all designs worked on a network of a million plus computers or clients. Uh, because, you know, if you, if you look at the Google Cloud or the, AMP or, or the Microsoft Cloud, for example, in both cases, they have more than a million servers. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we could work with any number of computers. And furthermore, as, the, the, as you add, you know, more computation power in the form of new mining clients, that the overall storage capacity and computational capacity of, of the network increased. Well, it's interesting because there's other projects. Um, recently, we had on uh, Greg Meredith of Scenario, and that project also seems to be taking a similar approach where all of the components of the tech stack are built mm -hmm. into the same architecture. Um, when you look at the way applications or traditional applications are built today, all of the components, whether they be storage, logic, and database, are typically not part of the same stack. You may, you, you may have... Uh, sort of recommend recommended stacks or stacks that become adopted by the community, like for instance PHP, MySQL, or uh, Node.js, MongoDB, uh, that sort of thing. And then storage, you know, can be decentralized. Or, sorry, can be distributed on like some cloud uh, architecture or something like that. It seems to be contrary to the way that tr traditional applications are built uh, in a way that we have at it, you know, the best interoperability as possible. Um, can, can you go into detail or sort of explain the design rationale behind why uh, Definity is chosen to build everything into one core system? Because I, I personally see that as some sort of a weakness. Yeah, so because I understand the question. Yeah, so it, 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 first of all, yeah, we, we're, we're very different to Scenario. And um, Scenario, uh, you know, has, uh, I think it's, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear more about how exactly they're going to create a scalable system. and. You know, Secondly, you know, they've also got this kind of stack of, you know, social networking layers and things like that, um, which are derived from a system that's um, certainly not a virtual machine. So, you know, first of all, uh, Definity is just trying to produce a tamper-proof virtual machine, right? A scalable tamper-proof virtual machine, but, you know, a tamper-proof virtual machine. And um, we're not producing... Uh, directly, at least, you know, any any kind of foundational layers on top of that for people. We're just the Definity project is just focused on the production of this virtual machine. So, um, stepping back for a moment and, and asking, what does that mean? Well, you know, if you uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's invention was actually, from my perspective, um, the, int you know, the introduction the introduction of something called a stateful decentralized protocol. Right, so Bit BitTorrent is um, a decentralized protocol, right? But it doesn't remember state. So you know, if I send a file to you over BitTorrent, it doesn't make any difference to everyone else. Um, Bit Bitcoin was different because, you know, uh, it produces this virtual ledger, right? And if I put a freely spendable Bitcoin onto that virtual ledger, and then you know, Sebastian, you spend that. Bitcoin on the virtual ledger. Well, Tom now can't spend that Bitcoin, right? So that means that the state of that virtual ledger um, has been remembered, which is why we call it a decentralized, sorry, a stateful decentralized protocol. Now, Bitcoin produced a virtual ledger. Ethereum moved the game on and produced a, a, a virtual machine, a virtual computer, if you like, a tamper-proof virtual computer. And this was a very interesting thing because we can in, install soft, software on it that runs exactly as you'd expect and if, if you want autonomously and independently from humans, which provides a lot of very interesting properties. So, you know, we, um, <clears throat> Definity is a stateful decentralized protocol that produces a tamper-proof virtual machine. Um, but it introduces the extra attribute that the virtual machine is scalable.
Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J A XX.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank JAX for their support of Epicenter. Now, you mentioned infinitely scalable, of course, that is sort of this, you know, holy grail in the whole uh, blockchain space. So can, can you talk about what does that look like? How does Definity accomplish that? You know, there are, there are many dimensions to the design of Definity. And, uh, you know, one of the, we introduce a bunch of principles um, and, we, you know, many of them traditional computer science principles into, into, into the design. So we like to separate concerns. So, you know, our designs typically separate, you know, um, civil resistance, consensus, validation, storage, um, so that you can, and we try and decouple them so you can, they can be addressed in an optimal way. Um, but at the core of uh, Definity, I suppose, is an observation about the importance of randomness that all decentralized networks and, and also high level, advanced high level systems ultimately depend on uh, incorruptible, unmanipulable, unpredictable source of randomness. And we um, introduced this thing called threshold relay, which you know, is the ultimate incarnation of that. So um, you, know, you could look at Bitcoin, for example, and proof of work and say, really, you know, proof of work, casting aside the civil resistance um, requirements for a moment, is really a, a random number generator. You know, you have this big, huge network of mining clients, and they all want to produce blocks. So Bitcoin has them race to solve a current puzzle, which can only be solved by brute force, uh, with solutions appearing in a Poisson distribution. And whoever solves the Puzzle, the current puzzle first is assigned t as a temporary leader and they can, they can distribute a block to be appended to the current chain. Um, you know, now, you, you know, there are some issues with that with respect to designing high performance networks. Um, in particular, the Poisson distribution, you know, whereby you don't know how long it'll take for a block to be produced. Is, is very problematic. So, you, you know, if, if you ever look at the uh, block, you know, these uh, block explorers for Bitcoin, you'll see that, you know, sometimes you, you get a new block 20 seconds after the previous block and other times it'll take hours, right? That's the Poisson distribution. Um, it takes a random amount of time to produce a block. So, you know, that's quite a uh, expensive and difficult way to produce randomness. We apply um, cryptography in a novel way to produce randomness. And not only um, can this randomness only be produced on the agreement of large parts of a network, but the randomness that is produced is unforkable. You know, it's unmanipulable and unpredictable. And using the properties of this randomness, uh, we can do a variety of things. I mean, there's actually a number of different high level chain consensus protocols or chain agreement protocols that, are, that, that can be used. Um, but perhaps more importantly for us, we can um, hang scalable uh, validation layers off the random sequence of values. So we have a technique called validation towers, and these are arranged into a thing called a validation tree, which is a bit like, does, does for validation what a Merkle tree does, um, although the individual nodes can, can behave Synchronous, you know, can, can op operate at different speeds over the network. 
And this provide, makes it possible for us to create a single digest of all the state stored, for example, on shards across the network. Um, and, and that system only really works if you have this incorruptible, unmanipulable, unpredictable source of randomness. Now, so I, I watched this talk, and this is a bit of a tangent on the topic, but I think it's really interesting. I watched this talk by Timo Henke, who's uh, uh, one of the people that works with you at uh, String Labs, who uh, describes sort of different ways that we can generate randomness and specifically how we can generate randomness in a decentralized way. And one of the things that he mentions, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, is um, and specifically, as you, know, as you as you pointed out, is that the the proof of work uh, system algorithm is gen is uh, is meant to generate some sort of a random of randomness. And um, if if we had this decentralized uh, true random number generator, uh, is there any is there any potential there to develop new types of consensus models that can work in a decentralized way, uh, sort of as proof of work does? Uh, but that you know doesn't uh, have some of the flaws of proof of work and proof of stake. Absolutely. So um, one way to see the importance of randomness is to look at Bitcoin and to imagine conversely that it couldn't produce randomness. So we'd see some problems emerging straight away. Firstly, if you knew in advance who was going to mine the next block you'd be able to DOS that, DOS that target, right? If you could, you know, I mean, obviously Bitcoin's become, mining has become very centralized and it's a bunch of pools, but let's just imagine, in fact, it was more decentralized as it was meant to be. And that somehow you'd stripped the IP addresses of the important miners um, out of the P2P network. If you knew which miner was going to uh, mine each block in advance, you might be able to DOS them. Uh, if, if, those, if there were higher level systems depending on that and you knew in advance who was going to mine a block, well, if, if an adversary controlled a sequence of blocks, he might be able to uh, you know, perform some manipulation on financial markets or something like that by censorship or some other strategy. Um, in, in addition to that, you know, it'd be very difficult to decide how to fairly distribute the mining amongst the participants. And in fact, even worse, you know, if it was manipulable, you know, one miner might be able to, and this is the kind of problem that, you know, would, would stop something like NXT working. You know, one miner would be able to choose what transactions to put into a block, say, to, you know, modify the random value that it created. And this would, and if this influenced which was going to be the, who was going to be the next miner to produce the next block, well, you know, you might be able to sort of an adversary might be able to take control of mining and just influence the path taken so that it was always his own, you know, clients that were, were creating blocks. So it's very important that it's not possible to manipulate randomness. And, um, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, you know, you have to solve these puzzles. So pretty much the only way you can do that is if you have the mining power and, and you can only solve those puzzles by having this mining machinery whir away and, and it's uh, the probability that you'll solve the puzzle first is proportional or approximately proportional to the amount of mining power that you have deployed. So, um, you know, randomness and is absolutely um, fundamental to uh, decentralized networking and, and as it happens also as it turns out, um, high level systems too. So, uh, you know, with the threshold relay system, uh, we sort of strengthen a lot of properties while also removing the need to produce random numbers in a, in a Poisson distribution. And um, because this randomness is deterministic and unforkable and unmanipulable and so on, it actually becomes relatively straightforward to create um, consensus protocols on top of it. And just a quick thing, I'll just say something quickly, which is that I'll talk about consensus protocols, but strictly speaking, it's a common misunderstanding. Uh, the, the word consensus actually is applied to traditional distributed computing protocols, which allow all the participants to decide a result and then move on. Blockchains actually are probabilistic, which is slightly different, and they, they're kind of eventually consistent. So something like 
Bitcoin is better described as something like a, a you know, Byzantine fault tolerant, eventually consistent log, right? And a, an agreement is kind of iterative and it, you know, it becomes stronger over time. So it's more of a kind of agreement protocol than a consensus protocol. But I'll, I'll, I'll use the word consensus from now. So you mentioned uh, mining. Now, you know, again, people know, understand Bitcoin mining. In, in Definity, does that look, what's, what's the sort of connection here? Would that also mean I'm going to be able to spin up uh, my machine and if I control 1% of the mining power, I'm going to sort of get 1% of the reward. Is there a block reward or get to mine 1% of the block? Is there a similar thing? It's not too dissimilar. I mean, in uh, Definity, we um, require mining clients to, firstly, to create a mining identity. And very approximately, we look at these identities as representing um, you know, some fixed amount of computational resource. Okay, So you create a mining identity by making a deposit of definitives. So in that sense, it's a bit like proof of stake. But because we imagine each uh, identity, or you require each identity to have some amount of computational resource, the deposits you make to create a mining identity are always the same. Right? So you know, if you look at something like Casper, you know, people make something akin to a mining identity by depositing stake. And that stake can be of varying sizes. So, you know, a big whale could come along and create an enormous, uh, you know, um, ID that would mine an enormous proportion of the blocks. Um, so in Definity, first of all, uh, each mining identity, which is like a, you know, public key, um, is expected to supply a certain amount of computational resource. And consequently, the deposit required to um, uh, create an identity is, is the same at any one time. It, it, it varies a bit set on this governance system, but um, that, that's the first thing. Then once that mining identity has been joined to the network and begins to participate in mining, uh, there's a thing called a unique state copy ID, uh, which is another new bit of crypto um, we're introducing, which uh, requires the mining identity to constantly report on a uniquely encrypted copy of state that it manages. Uh, and, and this is done in such a way that we can be sure that each identity has this um, copy, unique copy of the state because we need to manage replication. Okay? And it's done in such a way that, that we can be sure that the state uh, state that it's reporting on, okay, isn't just coming from some centralized state pool, right? There isn't just some, like, big, you know, mega server in the sky that is actually maintaining this state, and, and, and the, you know, whoever controls the mining identity is just, you know, forwarding queries to it. So, uh, yeah, it's a kind of combination. So, you know, you could look at that as a bit like, proof, you know, unique state copies are a bit like proof of performance. So it's a kind of Funny hybrid, really, in that sense. You know, the uh, identities are created by depositing some stake in definitives, but the amount of stake that you deposit is always the same because the responsibilities of that identity uh, will be the same as the responsibilities of the other identities in, re in respect to computational resource. And then there's this thing called unique stake copy IDs, which kind of holds the mining identity to uh, its part of the bargain and forces it to constantly prove that it's maintained this unique copy of the state. You guys mentioned Ethereum before, and it, it, to me it sounds like this is, you know, a fully alternative uh, protocol to Ethereum, going to be a, an alternative public blockchain that sounds like it's going to have some powerful benefits. <laughs> Today's magic word is Neuron, N-E-U-R-O-N. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. Can you explain, though, because you've also talked about how it's going to be complementary and sort of an extension. Like, how is this not just a competition and sort of an attempt to create 
you know, the follow on to Ethereum, just as Ethereum tried to create the successor to Bitcoin in a way. So I think the, the first thing to remember is that, you know, we, we don't believe in patents and it's an open source project. So all of our crypto and protocols could potentially be backported into to Ethereum. So, you know, and, and, and in fact, you know, we want to maintain the maximum level of compatibility possible with Ethereum. So, for example, our EVM is slightly different, but for the most part, it's the same. And, you know, rather than going off and trying to create our own virtual machine, we're just going to, you know, fund and assist Ethereum projects. So, uh, you know, potentially Ethereum can take all of our technology. The main difference is governance. So, I mean, in terms of market position, there's a, there's a, there's a few things, actually. I mean, I think it's probably true that we are more obsessed about scalability than Ethereum. Um, there are some things that come with that. I mean, arguably, you could say we favor consistency slightly more than Ethereum does, and Ethereum might favor availability slightly more than we do. So there are some you know, differences in vision, I think, at the um, network level. But um, the main you know, distinguishing factor is, is this governance and some other features that provide interoperability between private and public chains, which reflects the... Um, needs of some of our partners. So, you know, we see ourselves extending, you know, ex extending Ethereum and, and providing, you know, uh, and addressing a different segment of the market. You know, there are people out there that want the code to be law. Uh, you know, there are lots of benefits to the code is law approach, but there are also um, people out there that want a governed system, you know, that can reverse hacks like the DAO and things like that more easily. Specifically, the business community really wants that because, you know, if you're a big company, and you want to put, you know, a large amount of money into tokens in a virtual computer and, and maybe, you know, build systems on that virtual computer that become crucial to your organization, right? Well, you know, you don't want to find one, wake, you know, wake up one day and find out that your developer has made a mistake when they've designed the software or the smart contracts and some hacker has corrupted and corrupted it and put it in, into an unrecoverable state or, or and, and you know there's nothing you can do about it or even worse you know he's stolen tens of millions of dollars worth of tokens and the only answer is that you can use the block explorer to follow them around the blockchain right so you know um, a lot of businesses you know will happily um, uh, make the coders law contingent upon some higher level governance AI and you know for them, that's a, you know, a, a better alternative. So I think um, you know, it's not so much about uh, producing a better Ethereum as extending the Ethereum ecosystem. And so people have a choice. Some people who want the coders law systems can go with Ethereum. And people who want govern systems can go with Affinity. Yeah, so, so I, I, I'm really happy you bring this topic up. Uh, governance is something that we've been asking uh, people about pretty much any time somebody comes on with a project because I think at this point it's abundantly clear that this is a massive need. Uh, you, even if you look at Bitcoin, right, P there, there's a huge disagreement about what direction it should go in and there's no way of resolving those agreements. And then again, with Ethereum, we've seen the same thing. And it seems like a lot of the new protocols that are coming out are taking you know this seriously and, and trying to do things in this direction. So I, I'm very curious, can you run us through what the the mechanics of the Definity governance system look like? So um, you know we've got this thing called the blockchain nervous system. And the blockchain nervous system has so, uh, a privileged access to the virtual machine. So inside the virtual machine, you've got these things called opcodes, which are, which are a bit like assembly instructions, right? So, you know, in, when, when you're coding in C, you know, that compiles down to a bunch of assembly instructions that, you know, execute, you know, the, the CPU um, executes, right? And, you know, on Ethereum, uh, you have, a, you know, a language like Solid Solidity, and that compiles down to these opcodes, which run directly on the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. So we've you know, extended the Ethereum virtual machine to add some new privileged instructions, which can do things like you know, freeze contracts, uh, redistribute tokens, um, even run arbitrary code to you know, re reorganize things. And 
the blockchain nervous system uh, has is the only you know system on the platform that has access to these opcodes. Otherwise, it'd be chaos, obviously. <laughs> and uh, so it you know it's like a sort of super user on Linux or something, right? It can um, you know freeze bad contracts. It can uh, redistribute tokens. It can run arbitrary code to reorganize things that also, you know, have access to those special opcodes. Um, and the system runs, um, you know, like as, as follows, you know, people can submit proposals to the blockchain nervous system. You have to pay a fee in Definitives to, to stop it being spammed. There are different kinds of proposals, you know, some are very technical, such as uh, let's upgrade the protocol to this, and others are more related to to governance, for example, you know, how much should it should it cost right now? How much how much should be deposited to create a mining density, given the current value of Definitives, for example? And decisions on proposals are made uh, using a distributed version of liquid democracy. Okay, so mm. individuals can create neurons. Okay, you create a neuron by depositing definitives. It's a bit like proof of stake. And you can only get those definitives back by dissolving the neuron, which takes three months. So you have a big incentive to make sure that the blockchain nervous system doesn't make stupid decisions because your definitives might fall in value, right? You can't get them out quickly. It takes three months to dissolve a neuron. Once you've created a neuron, you have to install some client software, which, which we, I mean, loosely you can think of it like sort of thought mining or something. You have to install some client software on your laptop or desktop or whatever it is. Configure it with the uh, delegate key. And this client software behaves as follows. Firstly, you can configure it with a follow list, which is the addresses of other neurons that you follow on different topics, okay? So let's imagine that a highly technical proposal comes into the blockchain nervous system in respect to upgrading the blockchain nervous system protocol. The client software running obviously on the edges of the network would detect this proposal and display it, okay, in the, in the technical tab and it would wait for a default amount of time to allow the controller of the neuron to vote on that proposal. Now, if it's a very technical proposal, it might be that only a small proportion of the people who um, uh, hold, you know, have neurons would feel qualified to um, vote, on, vote on the proposal. So after a default amount of time, the, the neuron client software will go to the follow list for technical topics, right? And it'll say, right, has the first neuron identified by its address in the list voted? If so, follow. If not, back off. If it's backed off after a short while, it will come back. Has either of the first two neurons in the follow list voted? Okay, the second neuron in the follow list has voted, so just follow the vote of that neuron, right? So, you know, it's kind of asynchronous and non-deterministic, and eventually the, the, the blockchain nervous system, the sort of distributed brain, if you like, will cascade um, to a decision. Obviously, over time, you know, the follow lists get better. For example, um, you might be uh, particularly impressed by somebody on Reddit who happens to advertise the address of their neuron, and you might configure that address into your neuron's follow list, right? Um, and the nice thing about the decision, I mean, the nice thing about the system is obviously, on the one hand, it captures the expertise within the community, right? But on the other hand, nobody can know how these decisions are made. It's completely opaque, which is why we call it opaque liquid democracy. Because the follow lists exist on the edges of the network, right? And there's no way of capturing what those follow lists are. And this is very, very important because, for example, let's say, you know, um, Tom was, you know, the most, you know, given, given this follow graph amongst the neurons on some topic, 
Tom was the most influential per person in the community, well, there's a number of problems. I mean, firstly, somebody might seek, realize this and seek to kidnap Tom or extort him or influence him. Or more likely, you know, if some controversial decision was made that upset a regulator, for example, you know, somebody might try and sue him or, you know, some government agency, you know, might, might seek to, um, you know, do something bad. But as it is, you can't see how the brain makes its decisions. No, this, I, I love this. I think that's, that's very exciting. And it's one of the, um, I mean, liquid democracy, right? Maybe some people can relate to it a little bit in, in the existing political system, right? So today we, we kind of vote for somebody maybe to become a member of parliament and then they just make whatever, all the decisions as a kind of a delegate. And, and this in a way is, is almost a more fine grade way uh, of creating delegates where you can say, no foreign policy. I'm gonna follow this person on, you know, on this other policy. I'm gonna follow this other person. Um, so I, I think that's very exciting. Now, one question: you you call, you call this an AI? Why an AI? It doesn't sound like. I mean, it's it's more like a existing democracy than an AI. It sounds like to me. Well, you know. Um... You know, to some extent, it's, it's an easy way of explaining what it is, but there are some differences between normal liquid democracy and certainly major differences between uh, the blockchain nervous system and a you know, traditional democracy. So you know, rather than just a simple delegate democracy, what we have is a, you know, a, a sort of dynamic trust graph, I suppose, um, where you know, the... You know, I could follow you, you could follow Tom and so on, ad infinitum, right? And these, um, you know, there's a graph of follow relationships uh, that is not only dynamic in the sense people can change it all the time, but the way that, you know, it, it comes to decisions is very much non-deterministic and, 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 and dependent on timing and things like that. So uh, the, the dynamism is important too because the system improves its ability to make decisions over time as people update those follow relationships. So, you know, it's not like a traditional um, piece of artificial intelligence like a neural network or a Bayesian classifier, but actually those things are com completely different to a brain as well. So uh, in, some, in some senses, you know, uh, we've got a kind of distributed wisdom of the crowds processed through, you know, uh, this very dynamic algorithmic system um, of you know, uh, neurons following each other. So, I mean, ar arguably, you know, we've got more of a claim to be uh, an artificial intelligence than a, than a Bayesian classifier or a neural network. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll let Ledger CEO, Eric Larchevec, tell you all about how simple the Nano S makes it to securely store all your private keys. The Ledger Nano S is our latest generation hardware wallet. This is a multi-currency hardware wallet. It has a screen and buttons to manage everything on screen. You can generate a new seed, restore a seed, or set up your pin on the device. Your seed will never be exposed to the host computer. On the Nano S, you have different apps. You have the Bitcoin app, you have the Ethereum app, and you have the Fido U2F app for strong authentication, for instance, with Google, Dropbox, or GitHub. You can manage your cryptocurrencies with the Ledger Wallet Bitcoin Chrome app or the Ledger Wallet Ethereum Chrome app. With the Nano S, all your Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses are derived from one unique seed. With one seed, you can have in the same time Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic balances. And also, if you restore your seed, you will also recover all the keys associated to other apps such as Fido U2F, SSH, GPG. So it's very simple, just one seed and multiple applications. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER. So let's dive into the economics uh, of Definity and specifically with regards to the, to the neurons. Talk about the different tokens that uh, will be part of Definity. 
you know, there's a base token, uh, which is uh, Definity, uh, and they can be used as uh, fuel for computation, as Ether is in Ethereum. They can be used as deposits to create neurons. And by the way, um, there's a, like a sort of fault mining reward for neurons. And you receive this discounted by the proportion of uh, proposals you didn't vote on. So, you know, you would get a pro rata reward for your neuron, depending on how many definitors you deposited into it. And the voting power of the neuron obviously will be pro proportional to the definitors too. And, you know, if you miss half the, the votes, then you only get half the uh, thought mining reward you'd, you'd otherwise get. That's the second use. And the third use is you can create a mining identity. So, you know, definitors are best thought of as participation tokens. You can, you know, uh, you know, the most, I suppose, like, you know, an end user would use them just to pay for computation. But they also play crucial roles in helping the network function, either through its ability to make decisions, upgrade itself, you know, uh, reverse, uh, mitigate misuse, um, or, or through, you know, people being able to add new computing resources to the network to make it, uh, give it more capacity. So talk about how these tokens will be distributed or are they mine? What are the sort of monetary characteristics of uh, Definity tokens? So we've got two kinds of mining. One is the thought mining. So if people who hold neurons will be issued new definitives and people that are mining the network in the traditional sense, you know, by adding uh, computational resource will, will receive definitives too. So you, you've got like, you know, three, three different um, uses. Fuel is computation, uh, creating blockchain nervous system neurons that enable you to participate in governance in, in a form of thought mining that can also earn you new definitives. And m mining the network in the traditional, traditional sense by adding computational, extra computational resource, um, which again earns you more definitives. Yeah, uh, so I just want to, uh, I think we, we talk about a scalability point, the, uh, the, uh, the technology itself. We talk about the nervous system. I think another thing worth mentioning is the private-public integration. So the one way we treat, we, we design, I think, Definity very differently from many of the other kind of uh, blockchain companies is we see, we don't necessarily see private chain or public chain as one way against the other. Uh, people don't have to make a hard choice. Am I going to do complete private chain and be isolated and siloed from the rest of the uh, public services? Or am I going to complete public chain but exposing all my internal business internals? Um, now they can have a hybrid. We see a very similar paradigm to the internet. Uh, when you have the internet, you have the LAN as well. You don't lose your LAN, right? You still maintain your VPN or LAN, but you use the internet as a common meeting point. You use common protocols like HTTP, email, uh, Twitter, whatever, as a common meeting point for these services. We see a very similar paradigm emerging um, for the mass adoption of, of blockchain or trusted computing is that there will be lots of common services, um, identities, arbitration, et cetera. These are the basic building blocks. And especially when we're talking about more complex system like stable currency. It's not like every, every single company which wanted to use the dot, um, uh, dot blockchain has to build their own stable currency. They would much rather prefer using an existing solution. Um, for example, the, the Fi project we're working on, um, or it could be their, some kind of common bank coin, color coin they'd like to adopt. And they can just reuse that service. And Definity provide a way to integrate the two. So you can have an internal, a private Definity instance or a consortium Definity instance that's in your smart contract, you have a little declaration that allows you to call into uh, the public Definity uh, service. So um, all the different private chain can connect to each other and use common blocks. I think that's uh, kind of worth mentioning uh, in changing okay. how way people think about it. I, I, I'm starting to get a better idea of, of how this works then. So uh, what you're describing is services that would be built on the public chain and you mentioned a few so sort of like you could have an identity system you could have a stable currency you may have other services and in your on your private chains you deploy with uh permission nodes nodes known nodes uh you simply include uh sort of as you would in a program like in a regular application in exactly include libraries uh, to that external uh, public. Exactly, but it's uh, more than a library team. though. It's a more than library. Of I think course. traditional library is of course is a static library, a piece of code. Whereas here we're talking about a network, right? We're talking right. about a, a, a API of network. 
uh, okay. which is way more powerful. So can you can you describe then perhaps uh, what kind of use cases you see for that? I mean, I I can think of some, but I would like to know what what types of use cases you uh, envision for this sort of you know private blockchain also using a public blockchain service? Yeah, uh, I guess the most common use case I think we, we, we talk about a lot is supply chain system. And the weird thing about supply chain system, it involves many different pieces, right? Obviously in a supply chain system, you probably wanted to use ident identity. Imagine a semi-open kind of trade financing or supply chain system of a large manufacturer of hundreds and thousands of vendors. Each of them, you before they enroll into your uh, system, you might want to do certain identity or reputation check. Uh, that database, pro, not database, but that network or pro, public service exists on a public chain. You call into that chain, val valid identity. Uh, next step, someone is in your network, you want to do some sort of um, trade financing and you would need to move the money around. Um, well, money exists probably maybe as a stable currency on, on a blockchain. You probably don't want to use Ether or Definity as an underlying token because of volatility. So that's the next thing you want to use. Then, you know, the, some transaction happens, there's a dispute. Uh, where's my goods? Or there's some quality problems. Uh, you probably want to call into a public arbitration system uh, that resolves, specializes, for example, in cross-border um, disputes. We have a network of attorneys, lawyers, arbiters who are providing these services. You could imagine a chain of these services being, being called in throughout the life cycle, uh, something like that. And none of that um, services particularly, you know, makes sense, I guess, to, to recreate for internally necessarily. So that that's very that's really interesting in how um, I, I like that approach. You know, I I think that currently a lot of companies and startups building blockchain infrastructure uh, are sort of torn between: do I need a private blockchain? Do I need a public blockchain? Yeah. You know, we see banks doing POX on Ethereum, others doing POX on yeah. private blockchains, and. Uh, there's there, there's there's obviously a lot of value in using a public blockchain, uh, and there's a lot of value in using a private blockchain. And having this uh, this hybrid approach or this uh, sort of dependent one dependent on the other approach is, I think, as as a concept, really really powerful. However, uh, from your point of view, it requires it does depend upon those sort of services that you build on Definity. I'm, I'm not sure if you would build them or if uh, you know community members would build them, but those those services need to have, uh, there, there needs to be some kind of network effect behind them. Like if you have an identity system, it, yes. it needs to be widely adopted. If you have a stable currency, it needs to be widely adopted for you know, a consortium of, I don't know, like some supply chain consortium around fisheries or something like that to, to adopt that. Um, how, how do you plan to, to get there uh, how do you plan to, you know, bring you know, get to some sort of massive adoption uh, around these public services for all of this other, you know, private stuff to uh, be enabled? Well, I mean, just just quickly as well. I mean, uh, to answer the question directly through through you know business partnerships, there's a lot of businesses that uh, you know would like to use um, public blockchain, if you want to call it that. So more, more, think about it more like you know centralized computers, but um, they'd like to use public blockchain uh, facilities, um, sometimes just to link, you know, business clients who want to have private chains, um, and uh, other times to, you know, help them build a private chain more cost-effectively or faster and make it more powerful uh, by linking it into public systems. So there, you know, for it's well known that we're working with Boston Consulting Group, Digital Ventures, for example. And, you know, we speak to a lot of um, in, international companies through that, for, for instance. And so there's a, there's a lot of demand for this stuff out there. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, Definity isn't just myopically focused on the business space at all by any means. But um, we, you know, do have, you know, strong links to business. Uh, and do want to kind of help them build out this ecosystem, right? And, um, you know, currently, you know, there's, well, I mean, you know, my, my kind of opinion of uh, bank chains is, you know, they're just, banks are very worried about, you know, blockchain, so they're jumping up and down saying, we've got blockchain, and, um, you know, it's not, not really going to, you know, it'll help them optimize their systems, but it's not the future. The future is um, to have you know, the, the future really rests in the court of, of open public systems. And, you know, private systems will hang off those. 
and they'll be able to communicate with each other through these public systems and also build on public services like, you know, in supply chain, we talked about arbitration and identity and stable coins and, you know, maybe there's a haulage network so people can even, um, you know, get uh, goods delivered cheaply. And, it, you know, it's, it's a very interesting business paradigm because, uh, you know, as Tom says, you know, in the past, you know, we've been able, always been able to uh, build software by, you know, incorporating, uh, li linking in pre-existing software libraries. And in the future, people will be able to sort of build live business ecosystems by building on existing ecosystems as though they were kind of components, you know. So, the, you know, for example, there could be this network of truck drivers, right, that will deliver things. And you create some kind of supply chain system, and you're thinking, hey, I'd love to add some functionality to this supply chain system so that I get these goods delivered automatically if that's what the um, sender wants, right? And now you can just link it into this haulage system on the, the public network. And that's immensely powerful, you know, and a very, very attractive model for the business community, especially when you're talking about, you know, uh, 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 the, the kind of like high-end, you know, large companies that would like to leverage, you know, functionality for things like supply chain. Great. Now, um, with Dfinity, so what's, what's the business model here when it comes to maybe String Labs and or Dfinity? Uh, I mean, you, you guys mentioned that there would be a Dfinity token. So is the idea that, you know, you guys would own maybe some of this token and then, you know, if the network takes off, the token gains some value, that kind of model, or are you planning to develop services or applications on top of it? Can you share anything about what directions you guys are going? Yeah, so I think it's a bit of both. Um, so if, if, so in Definity, you know, the foundation uh, uh, will, there will be a certain early contributor pool. Uh, there will be many people, including Stream Labs, will be part of the contributor pool. So there is a certain token recommendation that the foundation will recommend. Say, okay, you know, here's your only contributor pool. Um, in addition to the donation donate donors, uh, there will be these pieces. Um, that's part of that. Uh, I, the other part, main part of the string last model is to create businesses and commercial service around the edge, right? If you think about the, the system that we create, a protocol we create are at its core, but there will be a lot of peripheral services around the, the decentralized protocol. Uh, for example, in the D Definity network, there will be uh, people who need to pr provide private chain hosting and provisioning. Um, configurations, there will be certain business partnerships in creating these common services that we talk about, right? Uh, so there are a number of these services that I think Streamlabs will, will specialize in. Or even more simply, um, mining, right? Yeah, mining. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, in addition, I, I think the other interesting thing is since Streamlabs kind of has lots of expertise in building these lower level network protocols, uh, there's also uh, additional services like Phi. We probably don't have time to cover that today but there will be additional, these kind of common services that uh, we could build. And around Phi, obviously, they will have its own ecosystem. I guess Streamlabs kind of generally think of itself very much as an ecosystem builder. Uh, we build open protocols and we provide um, services around its edge. Okay, great. So what's, what's the timeline here? When is Definity going to launch? So, um, you know, I, I, we just recently uh, in, incorporated a not-for-profit um, foundation in, uh, near Zurich and um, I think it's the first um, such foundation to get full tax exempt status and you know um, obviously you know String Labs has been uh, you know uh, providing money to get that made and um, there have been some founders who've put some initial funds in and you know uh, but it wants to you know raise additional funds um, but actually, in the, in the first instance, probably they'll just be a kind of like seed funder for the foundation because it takes a while to scale out operations. Um, and then, you know, it may do another funder later on, you know, once technology has been released and people have had the chance to evaluate things like Threshold Relay and, and see how it works out in the wild. Um, but time, you know, the timeline, it, it may be that the seed funder actually happens this year and that... Um, this main funder will happen sort of in, in, in the spring of next year. But 
we, we haven't absolutely decided yet, but um, I mean, you know, we're not trying to push it as well, like some kind of big, we're kind of slightly alarmed by some of these crowd sales. We're not trying to push it as some big thing. Um, we'd sort of recommend actually that, you know, it will be public, obviously, yes, everyone has a, who's interested has a chance um, to make donations and get recommended for definitives, but we sort of recommend that in, in the first instance that you know, only people that are really interested in, for example, running neurons or creating mining identities uh, actually make donations and get in, or, 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 or actually people that have got interest in building on top of the network. So we expect there'll be some you know, donations coming in from uh, you know, people that wouldn't normally uh, get involved in these kind of things. And so we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't, we'd, we'd sort of encourage people not to speculate on it. Um, and, you know, the seed, the seed donations round will probably only raise like a million Swiss francs in value, possibly a bit more, but thereabouts. Um, and then once the, uh, we've got these three releases, copper, zinc, tungsten, um, scheduled at the moment, the copper release uh, will have a kind of threshold relay, uh, very high performance uh, chain consensus protocol hanging off that and the blockchain nervous system. Uh, and, and the copper prototype will be released before the main donations round. And then that will be followed by zinc, which is interoperability, and tungsten, which is the sort of simplified version of our scaling systems. So, yeah, I mean, you know, keep, keep, keep your eyes pinned and there will be... Um, you know, a public announcement and a website and so on, probably in the not too distant future. But, um, you know, it, it's going to, the first seed round is going to be capped to a million dollars. And, you know, all these things, it's hard, you know, it's, it, it's a very risky investment. And it, it, we'd, we'd prefer people just to get in who actually want to participate in the network through thought mining in the blockchain nervous system or, you know, comp compute mining um, or actually building on the network at this stage. So. If people want to get involved in Definity and what you guys are building, should they wait until that comes out? Or is there something they can uh, do today? Can I mean, uh, you, you guys are not on the open source yet, right? So, for example, contributing code is, isn't something that's possible at this point. Well, you can, uh, you know, you can come and work for us, right? <laughs> and, you know, we're, we're, at the moment, we're, you know, um, trying to build out, uh, you know, uh, always... I suppose everyone is, but you know, <laughs> we're always um, wanting to work with great engineers, and you know that can come from, from anywhere in the stack. I mean, of course, we we you know are particularly interested in people who've got low-level systems programming skills, crypto skills, um, protocol skills. But you know, there's there's also other lots of other components to the system. You know, people who are whizzes in writing smart contracts and interfaces and things like that. So. You know, uh, I'd invite anybody that's interested to contact String Labs, and also the foundation will, you know, uh, be appearing on the web soon, and people could also contact the foundation to get involved. For example, as a you know, a, a, kind of like a you know freelance contributor, and you know, the a lot of the reason we haven't, I mean, there is actually some of our stuff is live actually. People just don't, people just don't know what it is. Um, but, you know, uh, we're using this thing called uh, BLS threshold signatures. And, you know, there's a library out there by a guy in Japan. And um, we're the reason that all this BLS threshold signature stuff has appeared in it recently. So, I mean, we, we do actually have open source out there. It's just no one knows what's related to us and what's not. Uh, so you guys, you guys are open sourcing stuff, but hiding under some guy in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're an open source company, right? And you know, we don't we don't believe in patents, and uh, so I mean, it, it's not actually an intentional thing at all. You know, it's just there's just been so much to do, and just getting it all together. And you know, I think it as a project, we'd much uh, rather you know make sure that we release something that I mean, the crypto, by the way, other people can use it. It's great, but the um, you know. That's why, we're, you know, we're only doing a kind of seed funder for the foundation now. We'd, we'd, we'd like people who want to get involved and donate to actually be able to have a uh, fully functioning client with Threshold Relay that they can, and they can actually play with it and see how it performs and create a neuron and things like that. So that we don't want to be in a position of trying to, 
you know, convince people of what we might be able to produce. We just want to show people. So. Cool. Tom and Dominic, thanks so much for coming on. It was, it was great talking with you guys. And it's exciting to hear where the project is going. I think a lot of these uh, new blockchains, new protocols that are coming out are really pushing the boundaries. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. And, and you're certainly uh, one of them that really seems to be um, at, the, at the very edge of what's possible and what can be done. So uh, thanks so much for your work. And we're, we're thrilled to see where it goes and, and hopefully also have you back on at some point. Um, Phi, we mentioned it briefly, but that's uh, a very exciting project as well. So hopefully once, uh, you know, once Definity is launched, we, we can also look at, uh, at covering that. So uh, thanks so much, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for having us on. Yeah, it's been great. And thanks so much for our listeners as well. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network, so you can find this show and any other shows on uh, letstalkbitcoin.com. And of course, you can download uh, and listen to the show in any podcast application or watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. Thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.